Hello, Oscar fans. This is Sam McEwen along with Evan Bland. This is this week's Pick 6 podcast. Nebraska baseball got robbed. <laughs> Has to go to Arkansas edition. Um, I'm Sam. It's Evan. Z is recording this, and Z and Evan are probably going to Arkansas for the baseball regional for Nebraska. Uh, the, the Probably the, one of the more successful major sports at Nebraska this year, no question about it. Uh, the Huskers are a number two seed, basically the number 32 overall seed, although I don't know if they're doing the S-curve in the NCAA baseball bracket. Uh, the Huskers made it, Big Ten champions, and their reward for finishing the season as strong as they did is to have one of the toughest draws in the first round of the tournament. If, if they're able to pull off the unthinkable and beat Arkansas, They'll have one of the easiest draws in the Super Regional, and they'll probably be playing at Arkansas again. Um, but we'll obviously talk about the Baseball Regional, football recruiting heating up this week uh, with uh, an offer, a quarterback visiting this weekend, Friday Night Lights, basketball recruiting. Yes, basketball recruiting is, is a big deal in June uh, as a number of major players are going to be on campus for the Huskers. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about Jack Quez Yant being put on scholarship and Delano Banton going to the NBA draft, although he can always come back to Nebraska. Um, we will talk about all those things on this podcast. I want to remind everybody that our sponsor is Team Schwalbach. The Schwalbach Agency is a family owned all state insurance agency. They're going to protect all of your big boy toys, the boats, the RVs. The motorcycles, it should be a perfect weekend for that. I'm guessing a lot of people will get out and enjoy that during the day because Nebraska baseball will probably be playing at night. They have four licensed insurance pros who can help you. Uh, there's also uh, a way to get, you know, your your roof looked at uh, and it's sort of a, you know, no risk obligation uh, to check out your roof if you feel like your roof uh, needs to be repaired or may have had damage from hail or the storm season that might be coming up. You can also reach out to Team Schwalbach on www.nebraskaallstate.com. That's www.nebraskaallstate.com. We're thankful to Team Schwalbach for their sponsorship of the Pick 6 podcast. Thank you to them. Okay. Evan, uh, he wrote a really good story from the uh, – Sunday's event or Monday's event of the uh, the NCAA tournament bracket reveal, and he said that the news of going to Arkansas, you know, arrived like a comebacker to the mound. You know, like oh, and mild applause from the from the players. Uh, their responses afterward, I saw. I think it was Jackson Hallmark posted a funny picture on Twitter, doing sort of the Michaela Maroney face from I don't know however many years ago that was now 2016 I think of. <laughs> What? We got we got to play Arkansas? We got to be in Arkansas's regional? Um, and, uh, you know, you asked some good questions of, I think, Jeff Adier is how you say his name, the Stetson Athletic Director, uh, who was the chair of the tournament committee. They had an impossible job this year. Um, but his answer to, to why, um, you know, there was Nebraska was going to Arkansas's regional seemed to be somewhere along the lines of, well, somebody had to. And uh, so, yeah, here we are. Nebraska baseball in the NCAA tournament, the second year of Will Bolt's tenure, going to Arkansas, playing Northeastern in the first round. Arkansas looms after that. The storyline of Dave Van Horn and Will Bolt and all those things is there. Here we go. When you think about this week and everything that happened maybe late last week and what's happened this week, what, how do you sum it up? And, and, and what are you looking for as you, as you write this week and go to Arkansas? Well, yeah, I mean, I was surprised, like <laughs> being there for the uh, watch party at Haymarket on Monday, the way that I've described it is the way the selection show starts, they list the top eight national seeds. And in my mind, it was like, well, OK, these are the teams Nebraska is probably not going to play <clears throat> in, in a regional because they've played their way out of that and that they would play somebody in the in the lower half of those uh, you know, regional hosts. And so when Arkansas's regional comes up first and Nebraska popped in, I mean, it was the, the first regional to be revealed. Nebraska was, uh, was shocked to say the least. And, you know, I, I credit their players for saying 
the right things and, and, uh, you know, not coming across as whiny or anything like that, but, you know, they were, they were surprised. They were a little chapped by that sort of a draw. And it felt like the way that they finished the season, winning 11 to 13, taking a series from Michigan at the end, winning all four at that Indiana pod, like they, it, I, I think pretty objectively had played themselves into a better draw than getting number one overall, uh, Arkansas. So, um, you know, it, it is what it is. Like, I think when you go into a week like this though, and Joe Acker, the senior outfielder summed it up pretty well. He said, you know, it, really it's fitting that this Nebraska team gets this draw because they've been overcoming kind of weird circumstances all year, whether that was off the field stuff, like, your own league coaches not putting them in the top six preseason uh, or on the field stuff like them being the only Big Ten school not to host a pod in their home city and having 15 home games like they they have found ways to overcome these things as opposed to using them as excuses or crutches. And, you know, a lot of that's a testament to the culture, the, the don't care culture that uh, Jackson Hallmark has so eloquently put out there uh, last month. But you know, this is going to be the ultimate test of that. Number one, Arkansas, obviously they're, they've are they been dominant all year. Number one for the majority of the spring, um, you know, it's, it's another chance for Nebraska to say, you know, we don't care. This is maybe we didn't get the, the, the most fair or the most objective uh, draw here. But I mean, you know, they've been playing as well as anybody in the country. They're as I'm breaking down just some of their statistical numbers. I mean, they're, they're right there. Uh, with Arkansas and defensively um, their pitching is, is similar. They don't have as much power as Arkansas, but they can score runs in other ways. Like, I don't think it's impossible to say that they could go in there and can compete and, and make things interesting. Well, are they favored? Absolutely not. But uh, I still don't think it's just kind of the, this situation where Nebraska is going to roll over um, the way that maybe the seeds and the, the pairings would suggest. They're not rolling over. They're not leaving. Um, Nebraska had a great season. Uh, nothing will change that uh, if they're not able to, you know, bust through and and, and beat uh, beat Arkansas in this regional. Of course, you would love to win a super regional. Would they have had a better chance to do that playing Notre Dame? Would they have had a better chance to do that um, playing Ole Miss? Um, let's let's just offer for a second. You know, they're not in these regions, so we'll move past it quickly. But if they'd been in a different region, if they had had, you know, if they were playing Oregon or Notre Dame, would would you have put them on the favorite line to to win their regional? Maybe. I mean, again, they've they've been playing so well down the stretch, and and they're not just getting the wins for the sake of wins either. I mean, they they beat a Michigan team with right. legitimate regional caliber caliber arms last weekend, and. Indiana before that had excellent arms. So like their hot streak has not come against the Purdue's and the Minnesota's of the world. They've, they figured something out since that sweep, that home sweep against Rutgers that maybe cost them a, a chance to host a regional. Um, and, you know, statistically, it's just hard to poke any kind of holes in their resume. Like defensively, they've not been a fluke. Uh, pitching wise, they've not been a fluke. They have some depth of arms in the rotation and the bullpen and, Offensively, they can score in a lot of different ways. So, like, I just don't I, – I can't look at what Nebraska's done really in, in any lens and say that it's been a mirage from a baseball perspective. I mean, they've been consistent. They've been resilient when they've needed to be rallying from that 9-2 to two hole against Ohio State a couple weeks ago. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you, you take momentum like that into the postseason with guys who know who they are. Uh, with some top end talent like Nebraska has with Spencer Schwellenbach and Cade Povich and some of these other guys, you absolutely would think that they could contend and, and, and play with anybody and maybe make some sort of a run. Uh, you know, the thing about Arkansas is they, they're just so, so uberly talented at every spot. And, uh, you know, Kevin Copps, their, their closer is just otherworldly in terms of what he's done. And so, you know, you can't rule it out. And, and I'm going to have a story later this week on, some examples of, of when the number one has fallen. And a couple of times that's been to big 10 teams. I mean, Michigan beat number one overall Vanderbilt in 2017. Um, Maryland in 2015 knocked out number one overall UCLA in the regionals. And then just two years ago, Michigan and the supers takes down Vanderbilt. And so 
as I looked a little bit closer at some of those matchups, some of the, the, the keys in those teams advancing, one, you got to win the first matchup of those guys. So if Nebraska faces Arkansas, you got to win that first one and make them work their way back. But then the other thing that all those upsets had in common is they were all low scoring games. So your pitching has to be on and you have to be the team as the underdog that gets that clutch hit or two with runners in scoring position. So the formula is there, like the blueprint is out there. Uh, it's not without precedent that a, a team and a big 10 team at that could do something like this, but a lot of things have to go your way. Um, and, and the margin for error definitely has shrunk for Nebraska from what has been a league only schedule to this point. Kevin Cox, the um, reliever that you're talking about for Arkansas, mm -hmm. is pretty extraordinary. So he has an ERA under one, and he has 105 strikeouts against 15 walks. I don't know what his whip is just looking at this thing, but it's really, really low. He's given up 37 hits in 15 walks, so 52 measured against however many innings he's at, 52 divided by 66 is well under one. Um, I'll try to figure out exactly. We're going to do math here. It's a <laughs> 0.78787 whip, which is extraordinary. That'll work. But here's the number that, that actually is interesting to me. And, and, and boy, will we'll, um, sabermetric people get pissed. But there's a purpose behind me saying this. He's 10 and 0. He's got 10 wins. He's not a starter. The fact that he has 10 wins tells you actually something about their team. Mm -hmm. And it tells you that you can go into the sixth or seventh inning against this team and it's still close. Mm -hmm. That's what it tells you. Their aces. So I, I, I believe Patrick Wicklander is their ace. He's five and one. Their other two primary starters are one and two and three and two. Now, again, they're playing in the SEC, which is a hell of a lot better league mm -hmm. than the big 10. And so, Arkansas is playing Tennessee, and yeah, no kidding. It's going into the sixth inning and seventh inning. Okay, okay. Ole Miss and all these other teams. But the point is that you can take Arkansas into a late inning situation, and there's way more at stake now than there was four weeks ago for Arkansas. They knew they were going to be a national seat. They knew they were probably going to be one of the top four. They, as it turns out, they're number one. But you can take this team into the sixth or seventh inning. Now, once they get there, they're the best team in the country, and it's not even close. But on the right night, with the right hit, and the fact that Nebraska's bullpen, with the baffling Jake Buns, who, again, I don't know how he does it, but he does it. And then Spencer Schwellenbach, who's a really, really, really good closer. Maybe, just maybe, you can pull off two wins against this team. Maybe. Right? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, some of the, uh, some, an another thing kind of to your point, as dominant as Arkansas has been, <laughs> Nebraska actually has the experience in terms of the lineup. I, I went through and looked at how, how, uh, how much experience do these guys have just in the lineup? Nebraska has got an average college experience at their school of about three years and change. Arkansas is about two years and change. If you look at their lineup, they have three guys who are at uh, junior college in the last year or two. You have a grad transfer from East Tennessee State. And so while these guys have rolled this year, you wonder, you just wonder if there might come a point in a tense regional moment when a lot of these guys who haven't been on this stage with these stakes and these do or die moments before right. might feel that a little bit more. Nebraska I think it, I kind of liken it to those NCAA basketball teams with like all the seniors and maybe they're not the, the most like overtly talented group, but man, they have a chemistry and they don't shy away in the big moment. I mean, Nebraska's got those guys. Joe Acker's a fifth year guy. Same with Luke Roscom, same with Mojo Haggy. Like they might not be going in the top five rounds of the major league draft, but they're also not going to melt in the, in the spotlight. I don't believe. And they haven't to this point. So I think that's something else uh that's you just wonder and and i'll be curious too how nebraska handles its pitching this weekend because it's gone Cade povich first uh all season and it could do that against northeastern because you got to win the first one um but if you recall nebraska two years ago flipped it when they were at the oklahoma state regional they put their number two uh in the opener against yukon and they survived somehow 
and they saved their ace, Matt Waldron, for Oklahoma State. They were up five to two into the ninth inning of that game before the bullpen blew it. So, so I just wonder uh, if they'll be able to, to to move some things around there. This Nebraska team has more pitching depth than that Nebraska team did, which is going to be really important. We've seen that on display over and over in these pod uh, weekends that the Big Ten has had this year. So, it, you, you just wonder. Like I just I, I don't think for as much belly aching as has been out there. And, and I, I agree that Nebraska didn't get a great draw relative to the season that it had, but at the same time, I don't think you can just assume that they're going to roll over because there are some things, there's some precedent. Like you mentioned, Arkansas plays a lot of close games for much of a game too. I, I just don't think you can assume this is going to be a two and done for Nebraska. I think that's fair. <clears throat> Arkansas has hit 93 home runs this year. Now they've done that against 56 games. So they played on, uh, 13 more games in Nebraska, but they did that against SEC pitching, which is better than what Nebraska's faced. Mm -hmm. They have 321 walks uh, in 56 games, which is a hell of a lot. It's about six walks a game. Dave Van Horn, I think when he was at Nebraska was a, was a much more put the ball in play. um, You know, let's havoc uh, run, do, you know, do a lot of the, the things that you, you know, you want to do. Um, Nebraska has 32 sacrifice hits this year. Those are bunts. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Arkansas has, I think 11. So what's interesting about Nebraska and Arkansas is Arkansas has fully embraced the major league baseball model of scoring runs. And it's been really successful for them. Their, their average, I believe, is below the Nebraska's, but yet they're producing runs at a ludicrous late rate because they, I think they have five guys in double-digit home runs. And so the challenge for Nebraska's pitchers are what? When you're facing a team that not only knows how to play the way that they play in the major leagues, and I don't have a problem with the way they play major league baseball today. I don't. I think the one thing I would add is that I think hitters need to learn how to face a shift better and they need to learn how to hit better. But otherwise I have no issue with the way major league baseball is conducted. Really? Not really. But Arkansas has embraced it. They know what they're doing. They have a, they have a kind of an MLB model of how they score when Nebraska is facing a team like that. And they have not faced a team like that all year. Not really. How do you change the way that you pitch and what do you have to be thinking about? Cause Arkansas is not afraid to walk. And when they swing, they're swinging for the fences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's all about keeping the ball in the yard. Like, as I broke down those teams, like I said, the, the pitching, Arkansas is a little better, but not demonstrably. Uh, the fielding is almost – Well, you got to take into relativity. I know. The SEC, though. I know. Right? I know. I know. Right? I know. Okay. Yes, that's true. De- defensively, they're, they're almost identical. And that part does translate across leagues. You're not making agree. mistakes, that sort of thing. I agree with um, you. It, it, it really it reminds me a lot of when they played Oklahoma State two years ago. It's very similar, I think, because back then those two teams were, were very much the same, except Oklahoma State had the power. And so for me, I felt like going into that game, man, if Nebraska can keep the Cowboys in the yard, they can do this thing. And they did that into the ninth inning until uh, the Big 12's home run leader went deep and, and it flipped the game. So like when I look at Arkansas – and they, they walk and they hit for power. If you can keep them in the yard, suddenly they have to, suddenly they're on the same level as you if you're Nebraska, except they don't have a lot of experience bunting. They don't have a lot of experience stealing bases. And so That's right. they're going to have to then string together two, three, four hits and your defense is already proven to be pretty salty. So that to me yeah. is absolutely the key if they play is limit the extra bases because you do that. Suddenly you have the advantage as Nebraska because you have, again, more versatile ways of scoring than Arkansas is used to doing. They're going to bash their way and they're going to do it pretty effectively when it's working. So right. that, that to me is, and, and, and I think that's why they'll probably stick with their, with their uh, pitching rotation that they've had with Cade Povich on the opener and then Chance Roach, because he's such a pitch to I agree. sort of guy. I mean, if he's on and Arkansas is hitting a bunch of ground balls and he's getting into the seventh inning, then it gets interesting. Then it gets really interesting. So I think that maybe it sounds too simple to say, but if you can keep Arkansas in the yard, this thing's going to be a game in the late innings. I agree with you. So he keeps the ball down. Now he's got to throw strikes. 
Um, one thing I noticed in Big Ten play, you know, I, you know, and I, I watched Chance probably two or three times. The hitter's discipline is just not as good as you you would you would think you would see. It's not as good as Nebraska's discipline. So Chance would get guys to chase and hit bad, you know, just hit hit pitches that probably weren't strikes. I think Arkansas is going to be more disciplined in that way. And again, Arkansas swings to hit home runs, and so it'll be interesting to see if they can get through the first game. And we'll talk about Northeastern here in a second. I do think Chance actually Chance Broach gives them a good chance to get into the late innings because he keeps the ball down and he doesn't, he's not going to give them that many opportunities. So the walk home run combo that they are good at, I mean, Arkansas is good at that. Um, Maybe less likely with chance Roach than it would have been with, with Povich and Povich doesn't have control issues, but he, he can, he tries, he, he can motor it by big 10 hitters. I don't know if he can always motor it by Arkansas guys. So we'll see. This is this is what's really interesting about the dynamic here is that Arkansas has a very specific way of playing on offense. It's different from Nebraska. Nebraska is more versatile, and they can do other things, and they force defenses to make plays against them. Arkansas does a lot more of we're gonna we're gonna sit here and make you walk us, and then when you throw a pitch we like, we're going to hit it over the, the wall. Mm-hmm. Northeastern. So uh, they have a really good pitcher who had good outings against Wake Forest and Old Dominion earlier this year. Uh, I think ODU is probably comparable to Nebraska. I don't think Wake is as good, but I couldn't tell you, honestly, sitting here at this moment, how good Wake Forest is. Um, Nebraska has historically had some issues in the first games of these regionals. They beat UConn, a pretty good UConn team, a couple years ago in the first round. Um, and then, but, but prior to that, they lost to Yale. One year, uh, you go way, way back. They lost to San Francisco in 2006 here in Lincoln. Uh, they've lost to, you know, teams like Bingington and, and I think Western Carolina one year maybe. Uh, so, so they struggle uh, at times against these teams. And, and Northeastern has a really good pitcher. Yes, I, I mean, a, a big – How? why is he at Northeastern kind of pitcher? Right. Yeah. Cam Schlittler, I mean, his numbers, 1.72 year A, more than a strikeout per inning. Uh, and, and like you said, it's, it's an, he's not playing against power, <clears throat> power five lineups uh, every week, but the numbers are the numbers and he's, uh, you know, he limits the walks. That's something that's going to hold true either way. And I mean, yeah, I mean, these guys are here for a reason. There's only 64 teams in this tournament. Um and usually if you make it, that you, you at least have one guy uh, as an ace that's going to win you a lot of games. And this is that guy. And so you have to watch out for that. Obviously, Nebraska, I think, will throw Cade Povich and, and keep make this thing a low-scoring game. But you just – you never know if a guy like that on the other side can, can you know, get on a roll and, and keep Nebraska off the board. Like, you got to be wary of what can happen – late in a game like that. And you, you kind of go down their, their lineup. They have a couple guys in the bullpen who have pretty darn good numbers too. ERAs in the low ones. And uh, it, it doesn't appear that they really give out a lot of free bases. So it looks like Nebraska is going to have to hit off these guys. And, and right. you know, again, the one thing that I, I just feel like Nebraska has gotten used to is facing these pretty high end arms the last few weekends. Like That's true. That's, that's very fair. Yes. You know, the, the way they've, they've beaten Indiana and Michigan the last couple of weekends, it feels like they're about as ready as they could be. And that's actually the other thing that is interesting about this dynamic, Sam, is that Nebraska is coming off a weekend where they essentially got a low stakes tune up against Michigan, where they didn't have much on the line, right. but they're playing a high quality opponent, Arkansas, Northeastern, uh, NJIT, all these guys are coming off of emotional conference tournament weekends where they had to grind for three, four, five games, put a lot out there. You know, sometimes that that allows you to get on a roll as a team, but sometimes you can come into the postseason then a little bit tired or emotionally spent or or whatever you want to call it. So Nebraska is physically and, and mentally, I think, as ready as it can be to handle some of these situations more so than they would have been um, in past years, too. So I think that could maybe play a factor as well. That's a heck of a good point. Um, that's a good point. I, I, I don't Northeastern doesn't seem to be I don't know. They had to win to get in. 
uh, more or less. They did Beatle Dominion, which was helpful, uh, probably to their cause. Um, but I think they had to win to get in and they won their last, whatever. Uh, they have one great home run hitter, Jared Dupere, Dupere, Dupier. I'm not exactly sure. 20 home runs or 21. He does a lot. He does a lot of their damage. 351 hitter. Yeah. That would be the guy to watch. Nobody else has more than seven on that team. So yeah, they have a, a big stick. And some other guys that can hit. That's, uh, you know, they're honestly they're built in a similar way to Nebraska, where they have high level defense. ERA has been solid. They can score seven plus runs a game, which is what they've been doing. So there are a lot of similarities there. They've just been doing it at a at a lower level in terms of their competition than what Nebraska has. And uh, actually, Arkansas fits all those same criteria too, except they've been doing it at a little bit of a higher level in the SEC. So and they hit, yeah, yes, yes. So yes. it's a really it's an interesting I think it's an interesting regional in that sense in that the top three seeds are very similarly uh, made up in terms of the formulas that they use how they win um, that sort of thing so yeah it's it's gonna be fun like I don't think Nebraska is gonna roll over Northeastern by any means on Friday I think they they'll win the game uh, mm-hmm. but it just it feels to me like they're set up mentally better than they have been at recent regionals it just feels like that don't care mentality. Like if you've been leaning on it all year, now's the time to throw that back out there and not let the moment get the better of you. And you know, we'll see. Northeastern. And they have to be in the, one of the top teams in the country at even attempting to steal bases. And certainly they have 119 of them. Yeah. Which is a lot. That is a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> um. So they obviously like to run. Now the catchers might not be for crap. In that league. And they're in the CAA. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Um. The catchers in that league may not be any good. I. I. I don't know. Um. Because that's a high. I mean, that's a high number. Uh. Third in the country. 118 stolen bases. Yeah. It, it'll be an interesting game. I, I, I think Nebraska has to really focus on winning it uh, because I think it's a game that they could potentially, you know, on the wrong night, and this game will be at night, lose. Uh, this isn't a bad team, and they're going to put their ace out there, I would assume, right away. They can't afford to fall into the loser's bracket. Um, even if they're going to run up against Nebraska again, their pitching death is not as good as Nebraska. So I would assume that, you know, Shea Shanneman is your number three guy, maybe Kyle Perry. Um, I think he's going to be better than what Northeastern has. So, because by the end of the tournament that Northeastern was in, you could see that their depth was straining a little. Mm-hmm. It'll be interesting. I mean, you know, I'm looking forward to the whole weekend. I, I mean, I got to do some football stuff, obviously, on Friday night, so I don't think I'll be able to watch a lot of that game, but uh, I'll be watching very closely uh, when they play Arkansas. Uh, so that'll be that'll be pretty darn intriguing. What percentage chance do you give Nebraska of getting out of this thing? Uh, they're going to have to beat Arkansas almost certainly twice, um, which will not be an easy task. As I don't know if any team's done it this year. I really don't know. Has anybody done it this year already? Beat Arkansas twice. I have not gotten to that point. Um, Shall we look? Yeah, check it out. I, I have a number here. I was going to share about that. Uh, let's see. One second here. So it's only been a number one overall seed not advancing past the regional round has only happened like two or three times since this went to a 64 team field three times since it went to a 64 team field uh, in 1999. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of of the history and and maybe the odds that Nebraska is going up against. But the more I was thinking about it too, Sam, I I just feel like, and I'm not, I think this is going to, this would be hard to research, but it feels to me like Nebraska would be, one of the most accomplished two seeds to play at a number one overall no in regional two. So, so when you look at some of the other twos and the histories of ones or of twos at number one overall seeds, 
Like, I, I just think Nebraska has got to be right up there. How many of those twos could possibly have been conference champs in a power league uh, that have been on uh, such a roll down the stretch? So, you know, I, I don't think it's a great chance, 10, 15%, maybe that Nebraska could win two against them. But again, I just, I point to the depth, like that Oklahoma state regional two years ago, they had two good games. And by the time they got to the third game, the, the pitching just wasn't there. They had used their high end guys and the back end uh, of the roster of the bullpen. Just, it wasn't up to par with the back end of the, some of those other teams in the regionals teams that make the college world series. But I feel like this team, you, you feel really good at least with the first three starters that they would roll out with, Povich with uh, Roach and then with their, I think they're going to go a combination of Perry Shanneman again, which has been really good. And and the bullpen, they have some arms to do it. Like, I just feel like there's more depth that they can hang with a team, the caliber of Arkansas a little bit more than they would have been able to in the last decade as in in the big 10. So, you know, it's still Arkansas is insanely talented. Um, They've, they've had an historic season. They're probably going to win. They should be the favorites, but I just can't rule. I can't rule out the the idea that Nebraska would hang. I'll give them 10, 15% chance that they could uh, pull the upset and shock the world. I don't see any team that has beaten Arkansas twice this year. Obviously lots of teams have done it once. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see. I mean, we're talking about a team that in the last three weeks uh, took a series from Tennessee swept Florida and, you know, went four and in the, in the SEC tournament. Mm-hmm. So, and only two, and only one of the games, only one of the games in the SEC tournament was competitive. They beat Vanderbilt six to four, but that game was a weird game early. Arkansas took control uh, pretty quickly in that game and kind of, you know, they controlled it after they knocked Kumar Rocker out. So we'll have to see. I don't know. I'm intrigued. Uh, you know, I, I think Nebraska has got a chance, but they've got to figure out a way to, you know, to, to kind of break up the way Arkansas does things. So, there's a lot going on off the field in Nebraska football and basketball this week. It's um, they're not playing obviously, but, but, you know, part of how you build great rosters and become more competitive is recruiting. And both of these programs and the, the Husker women will have, I think, a couple of visitors, too. Uh, but both of these, the football and men's basketball programs, have have important weekends this weekend. Um, we'll start with football and then go to basketball. I think they're important for different reasons. Um, I don't know that, the, that, the, the, that Nebraska football changes the trajectory of its program this weekend, even if all the guys commit, which I don't think they all will. I mean, I think you're gonna, guys are going to take other visits. Nebraska basketball, in theory – isn't going to get any commits out of this week and they might get one. I, but they could set the stage for something that's pretty extraordinary, you know, 10 months down the road. We'll start with football. Um, the Huskers are having their Friday night light event. It's, it's a, apparently going to be open to the public. Um, they're not really advertising that. I don't think it's going to be a big thing, you know, uh, but you know, we'll be there for that. They're going to have a nice group of visitors who come in this weekend. I think that list is pretty close to finalized, but you know there could always be there could always be a you know a, a final person that comes in. I'm pulling my because according to one of the recruiting sites, and I haven't been able to get a hold of Gavin Myers, but he's he's not coming this weekend. So that's one guy that was taken off the list. But otherwise, it's actually a pretty strong list of players. And I think, I think they're, they added one guy on, uh, Valen Erickson, they added him. Uh, but, but here's the list of guys that are coming this weekend. And there's one big name that we'll go over in a minute. Nico Dav, Davalier, who's probably the best overall player who's coming. He is a defensive end out of Maumel, Arkansas, uh, which is around little rock. Uh, he's basically down in Nebraska, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. Jalen Marshall, who's a who's a thick defensive end out of Kansas City area, Overland Park. Uh, he's coming up. Uh, I think Nebraska take his commit. He might be a guy that kickstarts Nebraska's recruiting in KC again. Ashton Craig, who is kind of a fast rising offensive tackle out of the southern part of Indiana, 
right on the Indiana Kentucky border. Justin Williams, who's a very, very highly sought after running back. Uh, Nebraska's got a good shot with him. Uh, of course, Nebraska has six guys on scholarship now. So, um, you know, Justin Williams is coming up. Uh, he's his, his recruiting star is kind of going up a little bit. Uh, he's got visits to Louisville, West Virginia, maybe Minnesota, and maybe USC. Dalen Erickson, who's been on the radar. Uh, we'll see how that goes. He's got Nebraska and Tennessee. Chase Androff uh, is sort of a uh, James Carney-esque tight end guy that's kind of a fast riser. He has mostly uh, G5 offers. Landon Sampson, a speedster receiver out of South Lake Carroll, Texas. For people who have heard that name before, that high school is where Chase Daniel played. It's one of the better high schools in Texas. And Landon Sampson did not play much his first two years there. And then he had a huge uh, junior season. And so that has turned his recruiting into a really big thing. And Nebraska's right at the top, but he's going to take a visit to Ohio State too because Ohio State recruits the hell out of Texas. And then Richard Torres, the quarterback from San Antonio Southside that Nebraska had really sought after and wanted. Uh, they, they, they were the first major program to offer him, and he's going to make an official visit up here. He has another one in theory for Kansas State, but Nebraska is in the driver's seat, and they, I think they really want to see what Torres can do. Um, now, I don't know that he's going to throw at anything. I don't know if he's going to be in the FNL. I don't think he is going to be in that. In theory, they can put him through a workout when he's here. They're allowed to do that. They did that with Jake Applegate earlier this week, and he got an offer. Wouldn't surprise me if Torres throws the ball around a little bit. Uh, I think they want to see his arm strength. They want to see how far he can throw it. And they want to see maybe some of his mobility. But it's a good recruiting weekend for Nebraska. I know there's some people out there who have been kind of critical of, well, there's no four or five stars here. Remember when this guy would come in or this, that guy would come in. And that's a legitimate criticism, I suppose. But my, my return comment to that is a lot of those guys never, never came here anyway. Or if they did, they left. And so, you know, we're talking about Ty John Lindsay, or we're talking about Tristan Jebbia, or we're talking about Brian Hightower or Michael Parsons, or, uh, Buki, you know, Radley Hiles. These, either these guys never came here or they, you know, they didn't last here. I think Markel Dismuke is one of the few who did. Um, you know, Keyshawn Johnson Jr. was out of here by, but like five months before, after he got here. Um, you know, uh, so a lot of these guys that just they didn't, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't end up staying. Uh, they end up going somewhere else or doing something else. Mario Goodrich didn't come here. Uh, can't remember the guy, the name of the guy that the receiver who was committed here for a while, and then you know, he was at this thing. But at the end of the day, they they didn't get a lot out of the the star studded thing, although it was fun to watch. And so I think this group of players is probably more commensurate with where they're at, A, as a program. They've lost four straight – they've had four straight losing seasons. And B, as I wrote in a, you know, in a, in a extra points piece on Monday, Nebraska has built their roster to the point where they can actually be a little choosy about who they pick and who they add to the program, and it should be value-added situations. You're not necessarily at this point going after guys and trying to shoot for the moon or adding guys just to add guys. There are, everybody knows who covers this stuff. There are four stars out there who are risks academically or whatever. You can put them on their recruiting role and it looks good come signing day, but you never, you don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, Nebraska signed a few of those guys out of junior college. Oh, you know, guys that they weren't entirely sure we're going to make it. Then did make it. Then they weren't ready. And then, you know, We'll see. Keem Green flamed out in the dab. Joseph came late. You know, now he's banged up in spring. You know, so you can add guys to your recruiting roles that make your class look really good. Like it improves the ranking of your class. But you want to make, but Nebraska is now in a position to say, well, if we only add 19 or 20 guys and we save five or six or seven even for the transfer portal. We know these 19 guys are all going to qualify. They're all the kind of guys that we like. Um, they fit what we do, and, and they fit our depth chart nicely. And I think Nebraska's actually set themselves up pretty well for a good June. It may not be a star-studded June, but Iowa and Wisconsin don't always have star-studded Junes, and they have pretty good football teams. Yeah, doesn't it seem like that's one of the 
I guess, adjustments that Scott Frost and his staff has made have made since they've been at Nebraska. I mean, it felt like that first couple of years, they're, they're, they're pounding the coasts and, and bringing in these four-star guys. And, um, you know, I just wonder if maybe the, the pandemic, which forced them to go more of a regional sort of recruiting approach this last cycle, really helps, uh, you know, jumpstart a, a new sort of philosophy with recruiting, where you are being a little bit more regional, where, uh, you know, you, you want guys that are closer to home because they're not going to get homesick or they're not going to leave or they have support systems and things like that. And you, you just wonder, like, this this feels to me like it's an extension of that pandemic-forced sort of regional approach that they had last cycle um, where, where guys in, in, in the Midwest or, or in the region are coming in and they're not uh, expending a ton of hours and flight time on guys down in Florida who may or may not come. And, and again, like a handful of those guys you, you should, you absolutely want, and they can help your program, but it does feel like more of their energies and focuses have, have shifted to the region in the last couple cycles. Uh, it feels that way to me, at least. I don't know if you agree, but it, I, I think it's a sort of adjustment that would serve them well moving forward. Well, you know, and I, it, I agree with you. I want to make sure that, as I say this, there's that caveat if Nebraska is not going to turn down a five-star who wants to come and visit and play, play football for the Cornhuskers. Sure. Let's be clear about that. Sure. They, <laughs> they wouldn't do that. Um, Thomas Fedoni, who was right on the line of being a five-star, obviously, was, was a coveted recruit. Turner Corcoran, right on the line of being a five-star. You know, same deal. Wondell Robinson, I think there was a moment. And it was probably a moment where Scott Frost maybe wishes he had trusted his intuition, where there was a moment where they were like, you know what, there's something not quite right about this situation. And this is a kid we're going to have to, who's a great kid, but has people behind him that are kind of high maintenance. And when Wando walked away in 2019, I think there was a kind of, well, we'll, we'll, we'll go find somebody else. And I think, I think Scott had Scott, who I think, a pretty good understander of people um, had that impulse, and but Walters and Held and others went out, went and fought for Wandale, and he had two good seasons here. Wandale did won him several games. They don't win the they don't win the Northwestern game in 2019 without Wandale. So this isn't a knock on him, but of course Wandale left. <laughs> so you know, there's I think what Nebraska understands at this moment is. We have to have guys who are who stay, who are sustainable, who aren't going to, you know, that have sort of an Adrian Martinez mindset. And it, they've lost some guys that I don't know, you know, had that. Guys that, that are super good kids, very competitive, great athletes, but they're just a little antsy. And I don't think that's the story with Wandell. I think there was a variety of reasons there, some pretty legitimate. His mom got sick. Um, you know, he mentioned that um, there were issues with him always having to go play running back because they didn't have anybody who could do it. And that was on Nebraska. They needed to find better running backs to run back there so that Wandell didn't have to always do it. But with Luke, yeah, you know, I mean, that's a guy I think Scott Frost believed in McCaffrey. I think Verduzco believed in him. And I think Luke just didn't want to wait his turn. He, he didn't want to wait and he'd had a taste of starting and now he's going to, you know, he's going to Louisville. I don't know what's going to happen there for him. It may not go any better there. Um, I don't think he's going to be the starter this year. So, you know, there's, there's certain aspects of wanting to find guys who want to be at Nebraska and are willing to stick through some of the adverse times. And I think they got burned in 2020 uh, with the, some of the kids they brought up who were four-star kids who, you know, you're kind of like, why do you want to leave where you're from if you've got all these other offers? And they had them at Florida State, Miami, and all this. And they, they came up to Nebraska. They got here. COVID hit. They leave. I think there's a sense of Nebraska wanting to make sure that when they're signing kids, they're getting kids who, who are, you know, want to stay and want to develop. And I think Nebraska want, desires to be a more developmental program. You throw that out the window when a five-star walks across your campus and you don't, who cares if Micah Parsons wants to come to Nebraska and work out at a Friday night lights, let him, mm -hmm. you know, um, 
do that. And, the, and Riley did. Now, Barsons also made an official visit. I talked to his dad at that visit. It was pretty clear Mike Barsons wasn't coming to Nebraska. But, <clears throat> you know, nevertheless, um, you do that. Five Star wants to come. You, you, you let that happen. And Nebraska basketball is going to have, I think, a couple of them here on campus this weekend. And so I want to make sure that people understand that. But simultaneously, you, you want to find the guys that fit what you're doing and where you're going. And defensive line in Nebraska, it, it's, it's a man's job. That's the best way to put it. It's the man's job. It's not flashy. Uh, you're not probably going to get 12 sacks as a defensive tackle at Nebraska at this moment. You have to be a man in there. You got to take double teams. You got to eat up space. You free up room for your linebackers. Um, you got you got to get big, strong, powerful dudes. And if that guy isn't a five star and he's only a high three, but he's six six and he's two eighty five, well, you you know you got exactly what you want, and you can't worry about where the recruiting services put that guy. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Can't worry about what Casey Rogers is ranked. If Casey Rogers comes in and plays like hell, you know, he plays like hell on hell on wheels for 30 snaps, then you got what exactly what you were looking for from Casey Rogers, you know? Yep. And so I think that's that's part of what they want to do. At the same time, you know, the number 23 class in the country is probably a lot closer to the number 40 class in the country than even number 13 is to number three. The, the, it, there's an exponential curve that happens at the very top of college football recruiting. Ohio State's on that curve. Clemson's on it. Alabama's on it. And the existential curve goes up really, really fast. Yeah. And the gap between Oklahoma, Ohio State, Clemson, and Alabama's recruiting, Georgia is obviously in that group too. And let's say Nebraska is pretty wide. And a lot of that's because of the five stars. And that's because of the very best players in the country. And I do believe that the recruiting services do a really good job of cultivating that top 100 list. There isn't a lot of, uh, there is no longer, maybe 15 years ago there was, but 247 and Rivals and, and ESPN, they do a pretty good job of making sure that their top 100 is, is uh, solid. Like it's, it, it's a quality, quality group of players. So when you sign 10 guys who are in the top 100 in your Ohio State, um, you can feel pretty good that about six or seven of those guys are really are dudes. Um, when you don't sign, when you sign one, you hope that you got a dude. And I think each cycle, Nebraska signed one, right? Fedoni, Corcoran, Corcoran, yeah, Wandale, and Wandale was a good player, and Martinez, yeah. And you know, so there's a couple others in there, Teddy Prohaska. Xavier Betts, I think, is a top 100 player in one of those. You know, they love Teddy down there. I don't know if he's going to play much this year. Xavier's going to play a lot this year. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> if you get a, a top 100 guy, you should feel pretty good about his production, and Nebraska has done a pretty good job with those guys. They need to get more of those, but if you don't get – if you're not in the mix for, you know, the high high four and the five-star guys, then you, you got to get guys who, who fit your – fit your thing and i think nebraska is doing actually a pretty good job you're not gonna hear you're not gonna hear me say much negative about nebraska's recruiting right i think they do a good job this this crew does i i do i i, I think they're pretty good um we'll see if they get any commits out of this you know the most likely guy is i guess jake applegate uh who worked out he's not going to go to friday night lights but he worked out took a little bit of visit uh lincoln southeast got an offer yesterday linebacker tight Lincoln Southeast has rolled out linebackers for as long as I can remember back when I was a kid. Um, Nebraska's had great Southeast players in their program. Um, the brute, the rude brothers, Luke Gifford, Gerald Foster, um, you name it. They've had lots of really good players from Lincoln Southeast. So Jake Applegate, I think is in that tradition of player and, who cares what he's rated? He's probably going to be a three-star, but they like him. They like what they saw. And they, they got to see it before anybody else. So I think he'll eventually commit. He's going to look around a little bit. But um, 
you know, he's going to look around a little bit, but I think he'll eventually commit. Torres is probably an option. Davier is going to definitely visit Oklahoma. Um, Jalen Marshall might pull the trigger. Ashton Craig likes Nebraska a lot, but he's got some other visits scheduled. Chase Androff might be that might be a name to watch because I think Nebraska is his best offer. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. It's going to be interesting. Be an interesting weekend. Next weekend after that's interesting. The weekend after that's interesting. I think at the end of June you'll see that they have about ten commits um, from a variety of names of mm-hmm. people who visit this month and Jake Apple. I still have the uh, the basketball recruiting month too. Sounds like maybe not as high profile, but pretty pretty big month for those guys too. Yeah. Well, it's not as high profile because we don't cover it as much, but the right. guys coming in are higher profile. <laughs> Right. Um, and that's just, that's just a fact. Uh, Isaac Trout will be in this week. Uh, he's a top 100 player. Um, Grand Island kid. He went to Creighton on Tuesday. Um, you know, I think Nebraska's done a great job of recruiting Trout and they've, I think the the way that they've done it probably gives them maybe an edge, but Creighton just signed a top 10 national recruiting class. And they just did that off of what was very successful. You're on the court, but, but a very difficult uh, stretch a month or so off the court. And they were still able to do that. Uh, they, they added some players down the stretch that were, you know, really good transfers. Good enough that one guy basically left the program uh, because he knew he wasn't going to play much in Antoine Jones. Uh, so you never discount the work that Creighton could do. Uh, but Trout will be here. He's 6'9", he's 215, uh, just what they're looking for. Good passer, uh, improving as a shooter, pretty good defender, long, sort of in the Wilhelm Breidenbach mold, probably a better scorer than Breidenbach, maybe not quite the shot blocker that Breidenbach is, but put him in that category of player. Um, so special, a potentially special player. Uh if, if these guys come through this week, you, you could see two five stars. One of them is the younger brother of CJ Wilcher, Simeon Wilcher, and he's a 2023 player. And I don't know if he's coming through this week. I think there's a, there's a chance. I think, I think he's going to come through this week. Um, Nebraska obviously had incredible success landing Bryce McGowan's the five-star once they landed Trey McGowan's. Uh, Matt Aldemassi had a, a long-term relationship, recruiting relationship with C.J. Wilcher, who, f- who left at Xavier and came to Nebraska. And obviously his younger brother could go anywhere in the country, um, but there's an opportunity to potentially play with his brother. Now his brother would be a junior by the time that happens, same as Trey, uh, but we'll see. Um, we'll, see if that's, we'll see if that's the case. And then the other uh, potential five-star rolling through is Omaha Bill U. And I'm not sure how to say exactly that last name. His name's Omaha. He plays for Waukee in Iowa. Same school as Michael Jacobson for anybody who remembers Michael Jacobson. They're the top program or basically the top program in the state of Iowa. They won a state title. Um, and this, this kid grew up in Omaha and then moved there. And uh, he, he could go just about anywhere in the country too. Nebraska benefits from the fact that he's he's from around here and 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 we'll see what he you know we'll see what he does. But those are those are big time visitors that are that are coming through. And they're gonna have some other guys this month that we can talk about on later podcasts. Um they need to find a point guard. Uh I don't think any of the three guys I just mentioned are. Um, but long term they need to find, you know, unless they feel like Karan Robinson coming in, the kid from uh, you know, New York City by way of Branson, Missouri is the point guard. And maybe he is. Um, unless they feel like he is going to be sort of the heir apparent to Trey McGowan's and Kobe Webster, maybe Banton. Um, they need to find a, you know, a Glenn Watson esque point. They need to find a really good point. So, and so, but I don't, so I don't know if that guy's coming through this weekend. Go ahead. I was just curious. I mean, you're talking about all these five-star coming through and, and, and high-profile recruits. Is this like we were just talking about with football, when, when those guys come, you take them and you find a way to make it work. Is, is Nebraska basketball sort of 
approaching that territory where if you're garnering interest from some of these really high end guys, do you bring them in and, and, and bring them onto your team and figure out how to get a point guard from there? Um, like, it just feels like Nebraska is moving up from like a, a needs based recruiting to, wow, we can get some really high end talent. Let's bring those guys in and then we'll piece it together from there. I guess, which of those kind of worlds is Nebraska recruiting in right now? That's a good question. The way you asked that. Um, well, you know, I think the first year that they recruited, they, you know, they came back as a true point guard and went after him. I think their thought process heading into last year was that Delano Banton was that too at six, nine and Banton's got an array of skills. Uh, I, I describe him as a better basketball player than Ken Mack. He's got an array of talents, um, some of which, you know, you saw and some of which I think need to be more developed by him. I mean, I think he just has to continue to work at becoming a better court vision guy because, I, you know, as he moves on in the professional ranks of the sport, unless he has a De'Aaron Fox-esque rise in his perimeter shooting, Ben's going to have to learn how to, you know, do all the other things, be an elite passer, score in the mid range, get all the way to the rim all the time, because he, he wasn't a good three point shooter at Western Kentucky. And he wasn't a good three point shooter last year for Nebraska. Uh, so either he has that sort of improvement the way that Fox has done in the NBA and Fox did it in the NBA. Um, Dan's going to have to grow there. Um, so he's sort of a point guardish option. I'm sure they would love to find a player who um, epitomizes what they're looking for in a point guard. Um, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the narrative tropes that everybody falls back on is, you know, uh, we always talk about the first guy that Hoiberg got, which was Royce White, I think was his name. That, that, mm -hmm. And he, he was, he was off the charts good at a lot of things. And so, like, people tend to look back and say, well, they had that guy. Yeah, sure. You know, if, if, if he hadn't had some of the, the struggles that he, he's obviously had uh, related around mental health, I mean, you know, Royce Wright would be a triple-double player in the NBA. I mean, he's, he's an unbelievably talented player. You, you look more at the guys that Hoiber got after that. You know, DeAndre Kane, who was a transfer from Marshall, Monte Morris, you know, more of a guard. I think they'd love to have, you know, one of those players in the program. And Trey, Trey played point to some degree at Pitt. Xavier Johnson did too. He was a guy that was committed to Nebraska and then left, went to Pitt. Now he's left again. I don't know where he's going. Maybe UConn, Indiana. I can't remember. Um, but I think they would love to have. And then Kobe Webster was that too at Western Illinois. But I wouldn't describe either one of those guys. It's like both those guys could be off guards. Kobe, Kobe Webster actually looked pretty damn good coming off screens and shooting threes. Uh, so I'm sure they're still looking for that player. You know, that would be. Yeah. I mean, that's just the best way to put it. I, I, I still think they need a, a point guard. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, again, if can you find a six? Can you find Russell Westbrook, six, four, six, five guy? Sure. Yes. And that would be wonderful if it's that guy. Um, we'll just, we'll just have to see, you know, they have a guy coming in, Ramel Lloyd coming in later this year, who I think they like. And again, it's a unique, it's a unique role. It's, it's more, it's almost as much a mindset and whatever as anything. I think Trey probably has the most of that. Um, they certainly want to see Banton continue to develop in that, um, but it's, it's not just a player. It's a leader and a mindset and somebody who understands how to, you know, organize an offense and as as the, the the sport evolves and i mean this in a good way you're seeing that you're the guys that can do this are six nine and six ten too anybody who watched the the blazers nuggets game last night understands that you know uh, Jokic is is that player on their team like he he is the person who does all the organization for them. uh but it just kind of depends I mean, I think they can do it a lot of different ways. But the way you ask that question is really good. Because let's say you get you get five guys 
two five stars, a couple of four stars and a, and a center. And you just playing beautiful basketball. doesn't really matter if you have a floor general, you know, a guy that comes down and dribbles it and looks around and motions traffic. I don't think that's, I don't think that's that important, <laughs> but did Baylor have one hell of a point guard? You better believe they did. Sure. Did Gonzaga? You better believe they did. Yes. Hell yes. <laughs> did UCLA? You better believe they did. All three of them did. Houston? Eh? Houston was more, you know, they didn't. But you tell me that three of the four teams that were in the final four, do they have good point guards? Yes. Hell yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and great ones. And I loved watching all three of them, especially the guy from UCLA. He might only be, I don't know, what was he, 5'10", 5'11"? And so they managed, didn't they? They managed to find a way to get a guy on the court where, like, when that guy's got the ball in his hands, there's just no – you just know. And the most talented of those was Jalen Suggs, yes. And he's going to go the first or second pick of the draft. But I love the guys that Baylor and UCLA had. They're probably not NBA stars, but in the collegiate level, those are the kind of guys you, you'd love to have on your team. So – but that's actually a great question. I could talk about that. I mean, I'm sure they could talk about that for a long time. Inevitably, they want to build a roster that's really just impossible to stop. Like you can't take away one thing or two things or three things. And they're doing so much. They're doing so many things on offense that people just don't know what to do with it. Hmm. Eventually. I think that's the vision, right? Like you want to have guys, you want to have guys all over the court, kind of the way Creighton did. But Creighton had a point guard. Marcus Zagorowski is a point guard. Right. No, he is. He is. I mean, it's, that's who he, that's, that's, that's who he was for them. And, and he was so good at it that the, the other point guard they had went to Kentucky. And so I, I think Nebraska would love to have a player like that. Who's just that guy. And um, maybe Trey's that guy. I mean, Trey can, Trey can do a lot of things for them. And Trey started to get more confident toward the end of the season where, you know, he got back to who he was, where it's like, I'm going to the rim and I don't give a damn who's, who's there. I'm going to make a play in, in all the rest. And so he started playing better. I think when Teddy left. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see, but those are some of the names to watch this weekend. I, again, I don't know if these two five-star kids are basketball is a little different than football. You know how in football, everybody talks all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. It's not quite like that in basketball. <laughs> like there are recruits who are going to leave Nebraska this weekend who will do like six interviews. It's not this way in basketball. <laughs> it's, it's different, you know? Yep. And like a lot of times you won't know what people are thinking. And then like, you'll see like a tipped in edits or you'll see some guy at a camp who's kind of right on the, like, is he a journalist? Is he, he works for the basketball, you know, collective or, you know, cube hoops or something <laughs> interview with five star. And it's like a thousand words long. <laughs> like, oh, okay. You know, like it's, it's just different in basketball where sometimes these kids are so they've been so they're so out of the world that they're not like football players where even a five-star football player is doing like nine interviews a week with the media basketball kids. They're, they're, they're a cut above that. It's like the difference between a, a, a superstar football player in the NFL and, you know, LeBron James. I mean, LeBron James does his press duties, but how often does LeBron James just answer his phone and do an interview? Probably not right. very much. Or Damian Lillard, you know, like Lillard kind of works through one guy uh, who's a good, really good reporter out on the, you know, he, Lillard doesn't do a lot of <laughs> side conversations. He's kind of a, he does all his media duties, but he also has his, you know, it's, so it's just different. It's different in that way. So I don't know how, how the weekend Isaac Trout will talk to us. He's, he's great at that. Uh, they have another guy coming in. I think this, this weekend, uh, let's see. Uh, Chance Westry. is coming in. So maybe, but again, I haven't seen a lot of interviews from him either. And then uh, at some point this month, Miller North for Jason Green will come in and, of course, Jason Green was on the superstar team this year at Miller North. 
as a senior, Jason will be the featured player, and I think he's going to have a really big year. Really big year for Miller North. I mean, he'll be a double double guy. I think. So um, he's still developing. That's all the news on the recruiting front. What about uh, Jack Quez Yant? Um, How about that? Scholarship. He dropped that on social media to begin the month of June. And I mean, that's, that's a cool deal. He, uh, you know, I was, I was looking back on a story I wrote after he committed his, his such an interesting path to Nebraska where he attended the same high school in Tallahassee that Travis Fisher, Nebraska's defensive backs coach did. And so that's right. how the, the Huskers had an in on him back in the day. Right. Um, and I remember him telling me the story about how most of the Nebraska staff actually came by when they were recruiting uh, in the recruiting process to come visit him. And it just blew him away. And this was a guy who, for a number of different reasons, a lot of them academic flew under the recruiting radar a bit. And so it, it just, uh, it floored him that all these guys flew halfway across the country to see him. He commits to Nebraska, comes, uh, comes to, to Lincoln, he, he enrolls and he is not shy about his goals, man. I mean, he, he says, I'm going to be one of the best running backs Nebraska's ever had. Like he, he plans to do that. He has no qualms about putting that out there. Um, and then, Hey, to his credit, he has a great spring this year. Uh, he popped that 21 yard touchdown run in the spring game for the whites. Uh, he, he's, he's added a different dynamic to that running back room. He's more of the physical kind of rumbler between the tackle type runner that that uh, sets him apart skill set wise in that room and so uh, <laughs> he told me as much too a year ago he said I, I look for the contact he said it's going to take two or three guys to bring me down uh, I take pride in that so you, you love the bravado you love the self-confidence of a guy like that and for him to to walk on halfway across the country to to go through the process to qualify academically and then to earn a scholarship and potentially play a big role for Nebraska as soon as this fall. You got to love that. It's, it's a, it's a great story. Cool for him to have his, uh, his education paid for. And, and we'll just, you know, see what, what kind of role he can carve out in the team, which by the way, uh, doesn't have an established running back and, and anybody could still take that thing. Why not Jack I think we're getting the uh, tornado sirens because uh, it's the first Wednesday of the month. Yeah. Good. Happy for him. Um, he's clearly in the mix at that position. Uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. And people are going to love him. Mm -hmm. One, he's number zero. Two, his story. Three, he's 245 pounds. They haven't had 245 pounds since and back, really, since Quentin Castile mm. uh, in 08, 09. So, well, 08. He, he, I think he left the team before the 09 season. So, yeah, this is going to be – people are going to love – whenever he comes into the – onto the field, he'll get he'll get a huge applause. <laughs> like, people – now, the number zero jersey, which I think is one of the jerseys that is generally sold prior to the NIL era, uh, which is coming up soon. I mean, we'll see it in July, and I think they'll be able to start selling jerseys with players' names on the back of them, I would think, eventually. But I think zero is one of the jerseys you can sell, Right. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, well, him and uh, Feldarius. Be a popular Payne. jersey, I think. Feldarius Payne's the other zero, isn't he? That's uh, he is. the former uh, Ronald Delancey jersey. Yeah, but Nebraska's, you know, Nebraska fans have a relationship with running backs. I mean, it's just it's the one position at Nebraska that rivals quarterback. It just is. Uh, Nebraska quarterbacks a pretty special thing too, and and has been really since Turner Gill, but. Running back is also a very special thing. And so this guy will be the fan favorite. He, he will. I mean, we, you know, every time he gets on that field, that fans will love this guy getting out there. And I don't know that there's been a guy like that in this program since Amir, who, who fan, who the fans were just like, we love this guy. Yet will be, you know, he'll be the guy everybody wants to see. Yep, I agree. And and you see like how his interactions on social media, how he's not afraid to kind of put out some proclamations. Like he's, right. he, he 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 embraces kind of the the attention. Like it feels like he's going to be a natural fit 
at Nebraska at a position like that where a lot of guys, you know, tend to shy away or that maybe they don't want to put themselves out there. I mean, he has no qualms about doing that. And so if he has some modicum of success, like you could see how this thing could really take off in terms of his popularity and, and what he's all about. Diedrich Mills was popular um, and Diedrich yeah. was willing to talk and all that, yeah. but a lot of the other running backs are right. Um, really since Amir, uh, there hasn't been, and, and Terrell Newby, you know, he would talk to us and Amani Cross was good, but there hasn't always been that, especially in the last couple of years, just talking to guys and like, yeah, I'm the guy. I'm, 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 I'm the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the guy that's going to the carry this team. People like the uh, Zigbo. The Zigbo was a, a popular player. Too. Yeah, he, he was. He was popular. Yeah. So Yant's going to fill that role. It'll be fun. Uh, last note, Delano Banton declaring for the NBA draft. There's really no, there's no, uh, there's no downside to this. Banton will get an evaluation uh, that will be helpful. I think he's turning 22 soon. And so, you know, this is a helpful evaluation for him. He can withdraw his name by July 7th and retain his collegiate eligibility. And Nebraska obviously uh, would be a place he could return to. And, and, and he has a chance to be a starter. He lost his starting job. There's no guarantee he'd get it back. Um, all of the player, all of the, all of the important names are, are either back or they've been replaced by Bryce McGowan's. And so Thor was a starter at the end of last year as was Trey, as was Webster. Trey and Webster are back, um, and Bryce McGowan's is there. And you have to, you know, they'll have to make some decisions about how, now they don't necessarily play the same position. I, I get that. I get that. But simultaneously, there's other players now in the program, Keon Edwards, CJ Wiltshire. And th- those guys aren't going to, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to compete. And may may the best player start. I mean, I they're they're going to put the guys out there that that are absolutely the best players for for them to put out there. So, you know, Bryce McGowan comes in and and he's he's blowing everyone away, and and he's doing things that even Nebraska didn't expect him to do. And then Trey and Kobe are the right guys to have out there, and that'll be the guys that are out there. And then you're going to have you know Derek Walker in the post, and you'll have a four which I think is going to reti- re- continue to be lat mayhem. But if you get a quality four somewhere in the way, I don't know how that works. If Breidenbach recovers from this knee injury he has, maybe you can move lat to the three, but he's probably going to be the four. And so last, last probably going to have a spot. Walker's going to have a spot. I feel really good that Trey's going to be a starter. So I think you already have three spots filled. After that, it becomes a battle between all the other guys for those two other wing spots. <laughs> Banton's in the group. Uh, he's in the group. There's no question. Um, but I think an evaluation will actually help him. It'll, it'll help him to say, hey, here are the things that you need to do to get to the level where you want to get. Hey, buddy, you, 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 have, you, you, you have NBA talent. And they'll, I think they'll tell him that. You have the ability to play in the NBA. Here are the things that you have to do to get to that point. You're probably not going to get picked this year. Um, you know, but here are the things you have to do. And, and I think Having heard those things from professionals, I think Banton will have a clear, you know, group of things that he can work on if he chooses to return to Nebraska. And I think that'll be a positive for him. It'll be a positive for Nebraska. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that's probably the way it'll turn out, but we'll see. I'll be on vacation when he makes the decision whether he's going to withdraw or not. So mm-hmm. have fun writing it. Anyway, we'll yeah, see. <laughs> All right, Evan's going to Arkansas this week. Z is as well, person who's recording this. You guys had a great CWS uh, breakdown, baseball bracket breakdown that I hope people watch on video. It was really good. Kind of went over everything. Um, I suspect if, if Nebraska uh, does not uh, win this regional, uh, Evan will be on, uh, he'll be on vacation next week, right? That's the plan, yeah. So he won't be with us next week to recap it. Uh, maybe we'll pull somebody else in to chat about it. Um, but if they for some, if they're able to do it and pull this off, then my suspicion is they will be back in Arkansas to play Louisiana Tech or whatever other team is in that region. I don't really know. Uh, so we'll we'll just have to see. Should be fun, man. I'm yeah. looking forward to checking it out. Should be a fun experience, no matter what. And expecting some to some to see to see some good baseball. There's good barbecue in Arkansas. Not not necessarily as good as Texas, but it's good. 
you better get some. And then they have this place. They have, they have good fish down there too. Great fishing in Arkansas too. So you find a, find a fish place, a place for a fish. All right. For Sam McEwen, I'm Evan Bland. For Evan Bland, I'm Sam McEwen. Please keep that in the podcast, the part where I say I'm Evan Bland. Uh, this is the Pick 6 Podcast, and we'll see you next week.